Um, I saw the down at the bottom of the down there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you can park there all day. How's the sound in the back? Uh, good. It's okay. It doesn't. How about echo? <coughs> There's a bit of an echo. Is there still? <coughs> How's that? I sound like I'm taking some very weird drugs. <laughs> does it sound? Does it? It sounds like it's 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 I'm okay. watching a 1960s movie. It sounds okay here. It sounds. There's no echo out there. Not here. Okay. Well, who the hell cares what I hear? Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, a few announcements. Um, there are uh, uh, there's a book table <coughs> out out back, and um, after their uh, interviews slash talks, the various authors will be available to sign their books. Um, the next is that uh, I would like to thank uh, Randall and Janet for uh, Wallace for both the idea for this event and for putting it all together. And uh, so we should thank. Um, this, uh, this whole conference really started as a, uh, with a phone call from Randall um, in which he was in which we were talking about um, a lot of the sort of conferences or <coughs> festivals or fairs that happen around the environmental movement. And uh, something we didn't say that day, but something that I think about all the time is how extraordinary it is that, you know, some event around environmental issues is often called a festival when uh, we're losing a war and it's like hey let's have some celebration man um, it doesn't make any sense to me and so we were talking about how those conferences don't seem sufficient to the problems at hand and the crises we face and they don't really seem to address many of the larger and more important issues um, I remember years ago I was I was giving a talk at a um, sort of festival and the first thing I said when I got on stage is you know I look around and I see a lot of really sort of groovy soap and some really neat hemp products that I can buy um, but I don't see anything in this room that actually helps the salmon and the place burst into applause um, and I was not asked back um, and then I was at another conference a few years ago and you know most of these conferences not like this one I, I, th I think this was this is, this is based on my experiences of the two interviews that several of us did together I think this is going to be really great um, but a lot of the conferences I've gone to on environmental stuff I've usually ended up feeling heartbroken when I leave and one of the reasons I feel heartbroken and lied to is because like I did this one conference several years ago and I was the only person there who talked about either power or psychopathology. And how can you have a conference on social change in which you don't talk about power? And how can you have a conference on systematic oppression without talking about psychopathology? Um, it's like R.D. Lang had three rules of a dysfunctional family, which are also three rules of dysfunctional culture. And rule A is don't. Rule A1 is rule A does not exist. <laughs> and rule A2 is never discuss the existence or non-existence of rules A, A1, or A2. And so what this means is we can talk about anything we want at, at an environmental conference except for power or psychopathology. And that's crazy. And so, um, so we'll be talking about those today. Um, and the last thing I would like to do as part of my introduction is to uh, read the beginning and end of a dialogue I was supposed to have with a technotopian. And I know, yes, yeah, it's, it's like dialogue with a technotopian. Why don't you, you know, go talk to somebody who thinks that she's Marie Antoinette, you know? Um, <laughs> so the dialogue was supposed to be where each of us would respond to a question written, and then we would continue from there. And so I, I gave my start, and um, 
I guess if this were boxing, it, I guess, and I'm not trying to brag here because you know, I was talking to a technotopian, but I guess it would have been really a TKO in the first round <laughs> um, because nine minutes after he received what I wrote, he wrote back and said that he wasn't going to participate in the dialogue. Um, and I'm not saying this to brag at all. What I'm saying is that um, I kind of like this piece of writing and that it, I think, helps set up what, for me at least, the conference is about today. And the question I was asked was, what is the problem? And, um, and what I said is that there's a sense, a very real and overwhelmingly devastating sense, in which you could say that the problem is that this culture is killing the planet. 120 or 150 species went extinct today. Another 150 will be driven extinct tomorrow, and the day after, and the day after that. 97% of native forests are gone. 99% of native grasslands. Amphibian populations are collapsing. Migratory songbird populations are collapsing. I read this study the other day that said that migratory songbird populations of a number of migratory songbirds on the East Coast have gone down by 40%, or I'm sorry, 70 to 80% in the last 40 years. I'm thinking, man, that's terrible, until I realized that 40 years ago is after Silent Spring. So there's been an 80% decline from an 80% decline from probably an 80% decline from probably an 80% decline. Anyway, uh, mollusk populations are collapsing. Fish populations are collapsing. I don't know. Have you experienced, um, do you have less banana slugs in the last couple of years? Where you live? I haven't seen one for several years. Oh, no. Yeah, uh, there's been where I live, over the last five years probably has been a reproductive failure because the only thing I see now, I see the big ones, very rarely. I used to, I used to every step at night, I have to watch out if I'm step on a slug. And now if I see two or three in a day, <coughs> I'm lucky. Um, fish populations are collapsing and so on. Nearly all the rivers in the U.S. and the world are dammed. Dams are the death of rivers. There are two million dams in the United States alone, with 60,000 dams over 13 feet tall and 70,000 dams over six and a half feet tall. If we took out one of those 70,000 dams every day, it would take 200 years to remove the dams. And salmon don't have that time. Sturgeon don't have that time. 90% of the large fish in the oceans are gone. There is six to 10 times as much plastic as phytoplankton in much of the oceans. The oceans are being murdered. Big cats are going, great apes are going. Vertebrate evolution has effectively been ended by this culture. The world is being poisoned. There is dioxin and many other carcinogens in every human, in every human and non-human mother's breast milk. More than half the fish in many rivers are changing genders because of endocrine disrupting chemicals put out by this culture. And of course, humans are grotesquely overshot carrying capacity and are committing unparalleled drawdown. And our response to this is utterly incommensurate with the multiple crises we face. There's a sense, however, in which the fact that this culture is killing the planet isn't so much the problem as it is the ultimate expression of this insane culture's deeper problem, which is that it is omnicidal. It doesn't just destroy every non-human community it encounters, but it also destroys other human cultures. Human languages are being driven extinct at an even greater relative rate than non-human species. It dispossesses or otherwise destroys indigenous cultures. It harms women. The gold standard studies reveal that 25% of all women in this culture have been raped in their lifetimes. Another 19% have had to fend off rape attempts. And all the women I know say that those figures are low. All the women I know say the figures are much higher. Not every culture has destroyed its land base. The Talawa Indians, on whose land I live, lived here for at least 12,500 years. And that's if you believe the myths of science. If you believe the myths of the Talawa, they lived here since the beginning of time. Likewise, not every culture has had such extraordinarily high rates of rape. In fact, many cultures prior to conquest by this culture have either had extraordinarily low rates of rape or have been rape-free. The same is true for child abuse. So the question becomes, why do members of this culture act as they do? Well, we can discuss, and I have in book after book, reason after reason, whether it's this culture's system of social rewards, it generally socially rewards behavior that benefits the individual at the expense of the group rather than behaviors that benefit the group as a whole, which leads inevitably to competition, ultimately to atrocious behavior. Or whether it's that a way of life based on constant conquest gives that culture a short-term competitive advantage over other groups who are organized sustainably. An example of this is if you cut down forests um, and mine mountains to make war machines, you'll probably have a more well-equipped army than a group that doesn't do this. 
And that's not a hypothetical example. The force of North Africa, to provide just one example among too many, were failed to build the Phoenician and Egyptian navies. Well, of course, leading to the collapse of land base after land base, or whether it's a way of life based on the imposition, on the importation of resources that can never be sustainable, or whether it's that a way of life that produces waste products that do not benefit the natural world can never be sustainable. I mean, think about it. Plastic. No one in the history of the planet has ever eaten plastic. If I, if I poop, someone eats it. And, well, so as long as they're slugs. Um, and when a tree dies, someone eats the tree. But if you create something that no one has ever eaten, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, and no one in the history of the planet has ever eaten plastic. Um, so it's not sustainable. Um, or whether, you know, why people actually do, whether it's as many indigenous peoples, um, for example, Jack Forbes in his great book, Columbus and Other Cannibals, suggests that members of the dominant culture are insane or suffer from a spiritual illness that turns into types of vampires or zombies who need to consume the souls of others in order to survive. All those suggestions actually make sense to me. But I guess for now, I'll just say that many indigenous peoples have said to me that the fundamental difference between Western and indigenous ways of being is that most Westerners perceive the world as consisting of resources to be exploited, as opposed to other beings to enter into a relationship with. And that's crucial, because how you perceive the world affects how you behave in the world. There's a great line by a Canadian lumberman, when I look at trees, I see dollar bills. If when you look at trees, you see dollar bills, you treat them one way. If when you look at trees, you see trees, you'll treat them differently. And if when you look at this particular tree, you see this particular tree, you'll see it treated differently tr still. And this is true whether we're talking about trees or salmon or, or women. If when I look at women, I see orifices, I'm going to treat them one way. If when I look at women, I see women, I'll treat them another way. If when I look at this particular woman, I see this particular woman, I'll treat her differently still. So part of the problem <laughs> is that members of this culture perceive the world as consisting of resources. That is insanely narcissistic sociopathic, and of course it's destructive. Which leads to the final thing that I want to say for now, which is that another part of the problem, and this is of course in line with the narcissism and the sociopathy, is perceived entitlement. The culture as a whole perceives itself as entitled to take whatever it wants. And many of its members individually perceive themselves as entitled to take whatever they want. God gave man dominion over the earth, after all. And it doesn't much matter whether you believe God gave man dominion over the earth, <coughs> or whether it is you believe, as one social change author puts it, that we humans are creation of the most daring experiment, or whether you believe, as Richard Dawkins puts it, that science boosts its claim to truth by its spectacular ability to make matter and energy jump through hoops on command. I said again, it's really important. Richard Dawkins says that the way you can tell that something is true, science boosts its claims to truth by its spectacular ability to make matter and energy jump through hoops on command, which means that the very epistemology of the culture is based on enslaving others. Um, the idea that you can tell whether something is true by whether you can force another to jump through hoops. I have actually a better definition of how you can tell something is true. Something is true if you can live in the same place with it for 12,500 years and not destroy the planet. Um, So if you believe that you're somehow superior to these others, and it doesn't matter whether these others are non-humans, women, children, the indigenous, members of other races or classes, anyone other than the chosen people, then you can easily come to believe that it's acceptable for you to take what these others have, <coughs> including their bodies and including their lives. So I guess for now I'd like to say a significant part of the problem includes beliefs in male supremacy and entitlement, which certainly leads to the, leads to the atrocities of the rape culture white supremacy and entitlement, which certainly leads to the race-based atrocities we see, um, imperial supremacy and entitlement, which certainly leads to the atrocity of colonialism, civilized supremacy and entitlement, which leads to the ongoing dispossession and extermination of land-based peoples the world over. And finally, really, human supremacism, I think, is part of the problem, the belief that humans are the only species who matter. Um, so really, I, I guess I'll just skip ahead and say that um, what I believe is the fundamental religion of this culture is that of human dominion. And it doesn't really matter whether one self-identifies as a Christian, a capitalist, a scientist, or just a regular member of the culture. One's actions will be to promulgate this fundamentalist religion of unbridled entitlement and exploitation. 
And that religion permeates, I believe, every aspect of this culture. And that's a really big problem. A problem that's big enough that it's killing the planet. Um, so the technotopian didn't respond. Um, <laughs> so the okay. So the way that the day is going to work is that um, um, basically I will just ask a few questions that will uh, set off. Um, some of the, uh, I think, greatest thinkers on the planet, and some of the most important writers and workers on the planet. Um, so I guess let's go ahead and get started with the first one. And the first one is, I have to say that um, William Catton is, how many people in here have read Overshoot? Okay, homework assignment for everybody who doesn't have a hand up. I think everybody needs to read that book. It's, it's fundamental, to, it's foundational to any understanding of um, what's physically going on, both with the economy and with the natural world. It's, uh, well, why don't you give a one sentence, before we go to the real interview, like a one sentence summary of Overshoot. <laughs> If I could have done that a number of years ago, it would have saved a lot of trouble writing the book. <laughs> but the problem that I'm pointing to in that is that we've greatly surpassed the carrying capacity of the planet for our species. And we're in trouble because a world in which there's a carrying capacity deficit is fantastically different from a world in which there was a carrying capacity surplus. That's one sentence. <laughs> um, and one, put a semicolon. And then, <laughs> okay. um, and then can you, for the people who don't know, and then before we start, can you define carrying capacity? Unless you're carrying capacity is the maximum load that an ecosystem can support indefinitely, or more or less permanently, in other words. We can surpass carrying capacity briefly, but not permanently. And when we surpass it, we're in trouble. So, this is William Catton. <coughs> okay, go ahead. Okay, so the first, we're going to ask several questions together. Um, first one is, do you think that economic recession, that the economic recession ended more than a year ago, as economists have... Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, uh, why not, and why would they have said so? Um, what if it becomes a double-dip recession? Do present economic troubles have important ecological implications that earlier hard times perhaps would not have had? And finally for now, will there soon be real <coughs> economic recovery from this most recent economic re uh, recession? And the answer to that, of course, again, is no. I should begin by saying that some of my best relatives are economists. <laughs> but I think the, the problem with the economic view of the recession is perhaps epitomized by a statement by the guy in Wisconsin who is running to unseat um, the uh, Russ Feingold from the Senate. Uh, Ron Johnson, I think is his name. And he said that we are committing intergenerational larceny. Okay, that's a good term, intergenerational larceny. We're stealing from future generations. But he had it in, time, in, in mind simply in monetary terms. That we've got to get the deficit down and so on. If people would start thinking in terms of an ecological deficit instead of a monetary deficit, we'd be a lot closer to understanding what our real predicament is. We are committing intergenerational larceny in terms of what we're doing to the planet. Now, I've, this picture we've had up here all this time should be very familiar to you. This is one of the oil platforms in the Gulf of Mexico, and we learned a lot about that in this past summer and spring. But most people, I think, did not really focus on the real problem there. What are we doing as a species having to go after a resource that we say we need that is becoming elusive enough so that we have to drill First of all, five, a whole mile down into the water and then drill another mile into the ground underneath that water. 
when we first started the oil industry, we started having gushers every once in a while. And when, it, when you struck a gusher, that was supposed to be a good thing, lots of oil there. And the uh, pressure of the gas in the ground was pushing it out. We should have expected that when you drill under water, you're going to every once in a while have a gusher. We had a real gusher there in the Gulf of Mexico. And what we've got to learn is that the human species really has no right to punch holes in the bottom of the ocean like that. Now, um, if I can remember which button to push here, here's the picture of the oil production, as it's called, in the United States from uh, the start up to the present time there over at the right. And the point that I want to make here, first of all, is simply notice we're on the downslope. This is <coughs> annual U.S. oil production. Production is a, a bad term there. It should be extraction. Humans didn't produce that stuff. Nature produced it millions of years ago, deposited it safely underground where we couldn't reach it. Well, now we've learned how to reach it, and that's why we're in trouble. But the fact that we're on the downslope means that life henceforth is going to be different from what life was like when we were on the upslope there. A fact of life is that any organism and any population has to use the environment in three ways. Any organism has to use the environment as a source of sustenance, also as the space in which it does its various activities, and as a disposal site because we all produce something in the process of living that we want to get rid of. Now, in an overloaded world, this becomes a sad fact, SAD there, source, activity, disposal. I'm glad I was born in an English-speaking country because the acronym doesn't work in other languages. <laughs> Why is it a sad fact in an overloaded world? Because it's impossible any longer to segregate each of those uses from the other two. And so we're in trouble because of the fact that the three different uses interfere with each other. You got more questions? <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking about that. Um, <laughs> there's more to come. <laughs> um, okay, this question seems pretty, pretty uh, embarrassing, really. <laughs> um, but given public discourse, I think it needs to be asked. Um, does a finite Earth necessarily, and especially since some of your friends or relatives are economists, <laughs> um, does a finite Earth necessarily have ecological limits? What would you say are the most essential ideas people need to know in order to understand present and future circumstances? And why are such ideas not widely enough known, or why are they disregarded? Not enough people have taken courses in ecology that's the answer to the last question, I guess. Uh, or, not enough people have read Overshoot. I was pleased to see quite a number of hands go up in here, but I did notice that there were a lot more people that didn't raise their hand than did, so. Uh, but seriously, a finite Earth necessarily does have ecological limits. If you think about it, just, just open your mind a little bit and think. How is it that we have imagined that we could go on increasing our numbers on a finite planet forever? And if we just are not worried at all about overdoing it, this implies that we're thinking that it could go on forever. It can't go on forever. I hope I haven't lost that. There we go. This is the axiomatic <laughs> statement that I think provides the basis for answering that series of questions. For any kind of use of any particular environment, by any species, there's a rate or amount of such use that can be exceeded only by reducing the subsequent suitability of that environment for that use. If you stay below that level, then things could go on and on and on and on. But uh, if you exceed that level, you begin to destroy the habitat upon which you're dependent. And this is true for all species. There can be too many of any particular species. But ecologically speaking, the interact interactions between the different species have tended to keep each other in some kind of balance until Homo sapiens came along and learned ways of, of evading those limits. 
So we need a good definition of carrier capacity. I began by defining it as simply the maximum sustainable load, but uh, let's get a little more explicit here. Uh, for ranchers and range managers, carrying capacity has been a familiar term for several generations. The maximum population of a given species, obviously different species, will have different carrying capacities. Maximum population of a given species that a particular environment can support indefinitely, and that word indefinitely is important there. You can exceed carrying capacity temporarily, but not permanently. What does indefinitely refer to there? It means the maximum load that can be supported without habitat damage. If you exceed the carrying capacity, you begin damaging the habitat. Now, we humans are a very special species. Special in the sense that we're the only species that could get together like this and talk. So, in the case of humans, human carrying capacity is the maximum human population equipped with a given assortment of technology and a given pattern of organization that a particular environment can support indefinitely. And by indefinitely, we still mean without habitat damage. We're the only species that has any extensive technology outside our own bodies. Uh, Darwin was fascinated by the fact that the different species of birds on the different Galapagos Islands had different shaped beaks for using different resources on the different islands. Well, their technology was part of their bodies. Humans have a lot of exosomatic technology, and so it's as if humans were really not just one species, but many species. That's why we have to have that, what I've got in blue letters there, equipped with a given assortment of technology and a given pattern of organization. And so different human societies, in effect, have different carrying capacities. They can do different things to the environment that may result in habitat damage if they do too much of it. <clears throat> things have changed through time. The earliest human beings gathered naturally available and mainly renewable sustenance materials. They were hunters and gatherers. There were very few of them compared to the present human population of the planet. They were foragers, like all previous animal species had been. All other species are foragers. Humans can be something more. About 10,000 years ago, we made a big change by inventing processes that we call agriculture. Homo sapiens began managing ecosystems to ensure that more of what we wanted would be produced, and that meant less of some of the things that other species would have been foraging for. And so the advent of farming there meant that we had a different relationship to the ecosystem than we'd ever had before. We could sustainably have available the things that we needed because we were managing the system. Now, about 200 years ago, a little over 200 years ago, we made another breakthrough that was a disaster. We're discovering finally that it was a disaster. We became Homo Colossus, not just Homo sapiens, because we began to use the fossil fuels to provide additional amounts of energy. Human beings had long been using energy from sources other than their own muscles. They used the muscles of other animals that they domesticated. And they used wind power to some extent, and they used moving water as a source of energy. But a couple hundred years ago, we began using fossil fuel energy. The very fact that we defined the stuff underground that was carbon rich as fuels because it would burn and could release energy. That was, in retrospect, we can say that was our blunder. So we became Homo Colossus. What we need to realize now, and people just have not recognized this fact, is that that made us revert to being foragers. We'd made a great step forward by advancing from foraging to farming. Now we made a tremendous leap backwards in advancing to foraging again. And that's why I had that picture of the oil derrick out there in the uh, ocean on the screen for so long. Because what we're now hell-bent on doing is depleting exhaustible supplies of substances that we have come to depend upon and need very desperately. So 
Let's illustrate that with a slightly different way here with some pictures. Foraging means gathering the stuff that nature made available. Farming means we do the production of the stuff and foraging again on a super scale now. That's the situation that we've committed ourselves to. Now, part of the danger is we've made ourselves too dependent upon specific resources, and in this particular case, they were resources that are non-renewable on any kind of human scale. But even if we're talking about renewable resources, we can use them faster than their rate of renewal, or there can be other factors that make them not renewable. <laughs> they begin to be destroyed. This is the population exper experience of Ireland over a period of time. Back in 1739, there was a big freeze that uh, killed a lot of the potato crop and a lot of Irish people star uh, starved. So the curve drops down a little bit right back there early on. But then it took off again and they su had successful potato crops for a number of years and the population increased madly. And whereas you had started only right slightly above two million people in Ireland when the uh, takeoff began, it got up well over eight million. That's too many people for that size land mass. And uh, they had also become, for various historic reasons that we need not go into here, that the economists went into, uh, they'd become dependent upon the potato as a mainstay of their sustenance. Well then, a fungus invaded the island and began destroying the potato crop. And so the population curve has to drop sharply down. Happily, in those days, there was still surplus carrying capacity elsewhere on the planet. And so a lot of Irish came to North America, for one thing. But there were a couple million who met premature death from starvation and other diseases. But notice that the curve is starting to bend slightly back upward there as we approach present time over there. So the Irish are not necessarily out of the woods yet. You have some more questions? Um, yeah. Um, on a finite planet, why does the American traditional expectation of continuing growth and perpetual <coughs> progress seem so plausible to so many people? Um, has that plausibility been eroded? <coughs> And what has changed in our time to erode the conviction that perpetual growth is possible and desirable? I think we got the impression of potential growth simply because early on there really was a carrying capacity surplus for the kinds of use of the total environment that human beings were capable of doing. Then that plausibility of perpetual growth was aggravated when Europeans discovered that there was a whole second hemisphere, these two continents in the Western world uh, seemed so enticing. They were very sparsely populated relatively to, uh, in comparison to Europe by the Indians who were here. And they didn't count, of course, because they weren't Europeans. And so we started taking over uh, the second hemisphere. And then that was perhaps reinforced a little bit further with a <coughs> slightly later discovery of Australia and New Zealand and some Pacific Islands and so on. But uh, you can't go on discovering second hemispheres very long. Uh, there was only one real second hemisphere. Anyway, that's what made it plausible. Now, the population density of the second hemisphere is greater than the population density of the first hemisphere was at the time of the discovery. Moreover, we have become with all of this technological equipment that we've invented in the last couple of hundred years, a much larger species than we used to be. We're more numerous, we're also much larger than we used to be. And so we've made ourselves dependent upon non-renewable resources with a vengeance, and we've made ourselves dependent on vast quantities of the non-renewable resource and that's why the plausibility has ceased to be. Um, saying that the, to go back to the first batch of questions there, that uh, this recession was caused by the loss of carrying capacity. What I'm saying is that this recession has got to be different from previous recessions because it's occurring in a time when we've lost carrying capacity. And a recession in a time when you're facing a carrying capacity deficit 
is bound to have a different outcome from an earlier recession that occurred when we could still plausibly think of having a carrying capacity surplus. Uh, if, you, if you read um, Paul Krugman in the New York Times, uh, recently he was, well, he's in a number of columns, he's deplored the fact that uh, we didn't spend enough on the, uh, uh, what's it called? The <laughs> stimulus. Stimulus. stimulus program. <laughs> <laughs> I needed more of a stimulus to think of that term. <laughs> uh, he thinks that we needed a bigger stimulus and that we've made the same mistake that he thinks FDR made after the end of his first term when by that time people were urging him to get off of this deficit spending and so on. And so he did kind of retract a little bit. And he's suggesting that Obama today is facing the same predicament that FDR faced about 1937 beginning of his second term. Well, we're not in 1937 or 38 anymore. And so let's go to one more version of this. Now, that's 1938 there, the boundary between the white and the red under the curve there. To the left of that boundary, that's all the oil that Americans had ever extracted from underneath American territory from the beginning of the oil industry up to 1938. Part I've colored in red there is what we've extracted since then. And that's a hell of a lot of oil that we've pumped out of the ground. And we're on the downslope, as I say. We're not discovering new deposits anywhere near as fast as we're exhausting old deposits. And uh, so Obama trying to stimulate the economy doesn't face the opportunities for stimulating it that FDR faced back in 1937-38. Now, to enable you to visualize that quantitatively, think of a, an oil drum, you know, about this big around, about that tall, barrel of oil, 42 gallons. Now think of 10 of those lined up here. Now think of 10 rows like that, 100. Now think of 10 of those 10 by 10 row blocks of oil barrels, 100. And then think of that 100 deep. Now th think of tenfold that, so that you've got a thousand by a thousand barrels of oil, that doesn't begin to be this much oil. Now, think of stacking up 1,000 by 1,000 blocks of 42 gallon barrels, a thousand high. Think of that great big cube block of oil barrels. Okay, now think of 180 of those cubes of blocks of a thousand by a thousand by a thousand. That's how much oil is under that red curve there. That's how much isn't in the ground anymore for us to go after because we've already got it out and used it up. Uh, that's where we are now. That's why some of the things that once were plausible aren't plausible anymore. So will ecological limits dif differently affect people in different parts of the world? And if so, what facts will <coughs> differentiate the impacts on these different people? And um, why can't we count on technological progress to save us from ecological disaster? Further ecological disaster. Different parts of the world will be affected differently by the ecological deficit that the world now confronts because different parts of the world are using their local part of the world differently. Now the terminology that we've invented to refer to these different parts of the world has not really been adequate. When I was a kid first studying history as a grade schooler and then in high school, we talked about the advanced countries and the backward countries. Later we outgrew that ethnocentric uh, language and we started talking about developed and underdeveloped countries. Then we decided that even underdeveloped was kind of a stigma that was not quite proper and so we started talking about developed and developing countries. What we really should have been talking about was countries that are populated by Homo Colossus, that is the <coughs> technologically advanced, uh, fossil fuel ravenous, 
non-renewable resource ravenous countries and the countries that haven't yet committed themselves nearly so fully to depending upon exhaustible resources. That's the real difference. And if you divide the world into countries that are on one side of a development line and those that are on another side of a development line, obviously they will be affected differently. But the assumption that we tend to make on our side of the line that we are going to survive the problems that come better than the people on the wrong side of the line may be exactly the reverse of the truth. It may very well be that the countries that have not yet committed themselves to a ravenous use of non-renewable resources will end up better off in the long run than those of us that have made that advance. Now, I think you were about going to ask me next whether there's a way out of this. <laughs> um, well, is there a way out of this? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Let me uh, suggest, this may be a little bit fanciful. My favorite sentence in the English language, I told you a few minutes ago that I was glad to have been born in the English-speaking world because of that sad acronym there. Uh, it doesn't work in other languages. I found that even the word overshoot doesn't occur in other languages. Uh, overshoot has been translated into Russian and recently a Spanish language edition has come out and neither language had the equivalent to the word overshoot. I don't know what the word was in uh, Russian that they made do with it, but they talked about the, the collapse of the techno economy or something like that. And uh, the Spanish word is uh, rebosados which I guess simply means excesses. Uh, well, that's pretty close to overshoot. We, we did have a chance to see that this was the problem a long time ago. Uh, my favorite sentence in the English language is the last sentence on this bronze plaque. Most of you can't read it because it's on the bottom here. Uh, this is a plaque commemorating the first director of the National Park Service, Stephen Ting Mather. Who the Park Service was founded in 1916, and he's there's a plaque like this in every one of our national parks. And it says at the bottom there, he laid the foundation of the National Park Service, defining and establishing the policies under which its areas shall be developed and conserved unimpaired for future generations. That's the key idea. Conserved unimpaired for future generations. That's awfully close to recognizing the carrying capacity concept. Then my favorite sentence, there will never come an end to the good that he has done. I hope that's true. Uh, <coughs> what a fantastic sentence that is. There's only one word of more than one syllable in it. There will never come an end, never is the two syllable word. Never come an end to the good that he has done. Recently, I've begun wondering, there will never come an end to the harm that some people have done. Uh, and not that I'm saying that we could make the whole world a national park, but we needed to approach our use of the planet in somewhat the same mood as we were approaching, as he was approaching the national parks. We wanted to preserve them unimpaired for future generations. And I would hope that my uh, great-grandsons, two of whom I have, <laughs> uh, are going to have a world that they can still <coughs> enjoy, but uh, it's not going to be the same world in which I was a little kid. So did you want to use that as the end, or did you want to go with the last question? <coughs> that sort of answers in some ways. Is it possible that humanity's future has been irreparably damaged? Well, it may be. And in terms of what this conference is about, where we're trying to mount a real protest movement to just bring to a halt the devastation that we've been committing on this planet, I think we've got to remember what a multidimensional uh, onslaught it has been. There are three aspects to it, and just tackling any one of them isn't going to do the job. Somehow, we have got to end population growth because there's too many of us already. Even if we weren't using it as on a per capita ravenous basis as much as we are. 
We've also got to stop our technological enlargement of the per capita appetites for the stuff that the planet consists of. And then we've got to recognize the fact that we have extended our impact. We no longer, when I drive my car and emit CO2 into the atmosphere, or when I breathe and emit a little bit of CO2 into the atmosphere, it isn't just the atmosphere over me that is going to change in such a way that it no longer does the protection that I need from uh, carcinogenic uh, ultraviolet rays. It's the atmosphere over the whole world. We've, been, we've, we've extended our impact on the planet. We don't, we're no longer just local beings. So we've got all three of those things. That has diminished our independence. And so even though we are kind of impelled by the fact that we all have a job we hope, <laughs> and we have to earn an income and so on. We're impelled to give priority to our own individual needs, regardless of the planet. We can no longer get away with doing that. Uh, life is not that simple anymore. But what worries me is that we may, in our quest to devise a way of stopping all three of those development processes, we may become misanthropes. And so I'd like to go back to the thoughts of uh, an English clergyman several centuries ago, John Donne, who said, no man is an island, every man is a piece of a continent. And please remember, in those days, men, men, men and women, <laughs> all humans are pieces <coughs> of humanity. And what we need to worry about is, can we change humanity's aspirations to make them less habitat destructive without ourselves becoming misanthropic in the process. Uh, we need a sense of modesty. Uh, to go back to the National Park example, let me conclude again with a nice motto. Uh, I think maybe it's the Wilderness Society that has come up with this. But uh, when you enter a National Park, leave only, take only pictures don't take the stuff out of the park. Take only pictures, leave only footprints. Somehow we need the equivalent of that motto in our approach to life on this planet. five minutes um, for a pee break or um, to have him sign his book or whatever and then we'll be back in a couple minutes. <clears throat> I'm I mean I worry so much. In this case it was <laughs>